The Faceless Ones contains four lost episodes out of the six that make up its story, but as with all the missing episodes, fan recordings exist of the audio, allowing them to once again fill in the gaps by animating the story. What's interesting in this particular case is they elected to animate all six episodes, despite two of them already existing in their original form. I'm guessing it was to give them a consistent experience throughout the entire story, but you can definitely see that they took some liberties. While the Macra Terror improved upon the menace of the crab-like aliens, the previous animations worked to match the originals given what we had known. For instance, the invasion avoided anything that was beyond what the show itself had been technologically capable of at the time. Similarly, the animated version of the Tenth Planet included a direct recreation of a surviving clip of William Hartnell saying, It's far from being all over, to make it as close to the show as possible. I mulled this over a great deal and decided that I'm going to make use of the surviving episodes rather than the animated ones, because this is intended to be a look at the story they were trying to tell, and not specifically a look at the animated version. Nothing against the animated version, but if I have the original, it only makes sense to use it. So with that, let's get down to the faceless ones. Episode 1, a surviving episode, begins with the TARDIS landing on the runway at Gatwick Airport forcing the plane to abort its landing. The very irritated Commandant orders the police box removed, so some cops on motorcycles get on it. Now, I'm not going to make a habit of this comparing, but just thought I would mention that this chase is the only time that we see these guys, meaning that when the animated version was done, they weren't the reuse of an already existing asset. They were created solely to be in this episode that still actually exists. I just thought it was worth mentioning since one of the reasons for animating the surviving ones would be that all the assets exist anyway, making it easy and cheap to do so. Hence my confusion since these guys are not reused assets. Anyway, at the doctor's command, the group scattered, though he keeps Jamie with him since he doesn't know this time and actually thought the airplane was a flying beastie. It'd be best not to let him run around unsupervised right away. He may pull some kind of Don Quixote on the planes. But this is why, when Polly hides in a hangar for chameleon tours, she witnesses a pilot murder a man with some kind of ray gun. In a secret room, his security shows him Polly checking over the body, forcing her to run for it before she gets zapped too. When she catches up with the doctor and Jamie, she mentions the murder, but she's also concerned about Ben. He hasn't turned up yet. What has turned up is the boss of that killer, some airline captain, presumably with chameleon, and is very annoyed that the man he murdered is a police detective. That's not the kind of person it's good to kill at the best of times, and since he was probably in here looking into the disappearing people, well, having him mysteriously disappear is not going to make them look less guilty. Before they can dispose of the body, Polly leads the doctor and Jamie to it, where the doctor discovers that he wasn't hit with a bullet. He was electrocuted. He looks like a normal being more intelligent than most. He's a threat to our operation. I'll kill him. No. Damn it, Hedges, you can't solve all your problems with murder. Instead, they nab Polly and hit her with a freeze ray of some kind so that she can't alert the doctor and Jamie that she's been taken. When they notice she's missing, the bad guys have already got her tucked away in the secret room of their hangar. With no sign of her, the doctor tries to find the person in charge of the airport. And the person at Customs and Immigration apparently believes that's him. Without passports, they are not going anywhere as far as this guy is concerned, no matter how much the doctor points out that there is a dead body at this airport. Murder does not trump paperwork. They're soon being questioned by the Commandant, but the stuff about ray guns and disappearing Polly makes the already skeptical man think they're just screwing around. But he wants to see this supposed body. After Ben wanders in and out of Chameleon Hangar, we see the bad guy captain with the hypodermic and some humanoid in a box. This is the weirdest magic act I have ever seen. He's interrupted by the Commandant's group, who naturally find no body now. A tortoise could have had time to dispose of it. The Doctor and Jamie do discover burnt fibers in a scorch mark, showing Polly was right about the ray gun but shockingly, the Commandant ignores this ironclad evidence of a space weapon. A search of a nearby crate reveals only plastic cups, and luckily for the bad guys, 
the monster in the back does not get discovered. Dodged a bullet there. And to add to the confusion, Polly turns up, except she acts like she's never seen the doctor and Jamie in her life, and that her name isn't Polly. And it certainly can't be a coincidental double. There's no more chance of that than the doctor looking like a Mexican supervillain. As for the humanoid, the captain and Kill Happy bring it into the airport infirmary, leading us into episode two. We finally get a full view of the humanoid, some sort of zombie slee stack, but also a regular human on the next table. Wife Swap has gotten more and more desperate with every season. Meanwhile, Polly insists that she is not Polly. This is her first visit to England from Switzerland, and she just wants to get on with her new job. She's got a passport and everything. As for the doctor and Jamie... Hello, Super. Commandant. I've got a couple of illegal entrants here. Insert your own Brexit joke here. While the doctor and Jamie make a run for it, the bad guys get snipped at by Nurse Pinto, who says they're late, and Squidward might not make it now. She pulls out some Wii controllers to get this party started, and reveals that the man is Meadows in air traffic control, and soon the creature begins morphing into his form. By the time it's done, they've tweaked the settings on it, he looks and sounds just like Meadows and knows everything that Meadows does. Yes, even filthy little deeds, Meadows, you old dog. Well, while we were going full pod people mode, the doctor and Jamie hid in plain sight, but the disguise allows the doctor to spot a clue. Chameleon Tours, the place that Polly had mentioned, offers budget tours for young people, likely bait for their nefarious schemes. And just in the nick of time, Ben stumbles into them, so we just have to get Polly and we can get back to properly Scooby-Dooing this mystery. They spot her working the counter at Chameleon Tours, and when the doctor starts questioning her, she accidentally lets slip about the murder that he's investigating. And after that, the captain decides it'd just be better to send her back to base. Her presence is not helping the situation. But now, here is a fascinating thing. What about that man? He's very persistent. Remember that this person is on the side of the bad guys and has every reason to help them thwart the doctor. So why wouldn't she tell the captain that that man is an alien who travels through time and space in a fantastic machine, is capable of changing his appearance, and has made a habit of thwarting even the most well-crafted plots? Either she won't, or she can't. The first seems highly unlikely. The aliens seem to have the knowledge of their originals, but absolutely no sense of their loyalties or attachments. The latter, though, that suggests that Polly, even as she is, has been fighting them, not surrendering any information about the doctor in the hopes that he can rescue her. If so, she's got incredibly strong will. Well, seems the murder is about to be noticed because a colleague of the dead man is here, Inspector Crossland, looking into disappearances connected to Chameleon, including the disappearance of the guy looking into disappearances. Starting to get a little inception around here, isn't it? Meanwhile, the doctor is trying his own investigation, but being wanted by the authorities is a bit of a problem. So he lets Ben poke about, since no one knows about him, and tells Jamie to keep an eye on Polly, which is how he runs into Samantha from Liverpool. Her brother has vanished. The hotel he's supposedly in doesn't exist, and the police say that her brother isn't in any hotel in all of Rome. Except he sent a postcard from Rome, so he did go there, and then he vanished. Well, as established, Inception is how we solve things around here. Disappear everyone who comes asking about disappearances. So Polly tells Kill Happy that the captain needs to sort this out while asking Samantha to wait for someone in authority to return and answer her questions, by which we mean cause her to disappear. But this gives Jamie a chance to talk with Samantha. She might be of some help in the investigation. She could probably knock a pretender back to his own shape with a well-placed swear word. The doctor goes to see the commandant, whose first response is to call for the cops. But when he mentions the dead body in Chameleon Tours, it prompts Jean to speak up about Inspector Crossland investigating them for disappearances. But the commandant does not want to listen, so the doctor has no choice but to escape by threatening to blow them all up using this rubber ball. How he got that through airport security is a damning indictment, I say. Meanwhile, Polly gives Samantha the brush off and closes the kiosk, but doesn't seem to leave. When the doctor goes inside to speak to her, there's no sign of her, but there is the monitor. 
At the same time the doctor was poking around, Ben was poking around in the chameleon hangar. Inside one of the crates was Polly, insensate, and so he rushed to the phone to call for help. But now the doctor sees him get knocked out by a sort of pen and, in his horror, makes the bad guys aware that he has seen them. While they prepare for the inevitable with him, Inspector Crossland asks about Samantha's brother and his colleague when he learns about the claim of a dead body in Chameleon Hangar. But before he can do anything, the doctors arrived there, finding the stun pen thing and looking around for answers. But that's when Jamie and Samantha uncover a new development. The new attendant at the kiosk is preparing another group of youths for their trip and is there to help them by giving them postcards of their destinations that they can fill out now so they don't have to waste valuable time in Zurich on people back home when they could be drinking cocoa and looking for Nazi gold. But it means a postcard is no proof that anyone ever reaches their destination, only that the card was posted from there. Back in the hangar, the doctor has found the insensate Meadows, but Killhappy lures him into the back room so he can do his favorite thing, try to kill somebody. He blocks up the exit and then starts pumping freezing cold gas into the room, leading into episode 3. Facing the severe cold, the doctor bundles up and tries blocking the vent with a handkerchief, buying some time, but it takes more than that to satisfy Kill Happy. So he opens the door and comes out to deal with the doctor, but remember the doctor grabbed that freeze pen. He uses that to immobilize him and make his escape. And just in time for Jamie to introduce him to Inspector Crossland. He's interested in the doctor's story and says he'll make the commandant listen this time. He has the authority, after all. Although this is still a hill I'm not sure can be climbed. Meanwhile, the captain learns how Kill Happy has screwed up and told him to stay here and sort it out to atone for being such a loser. He'll have company, though, because Samantha plans to check out the hangar and convinces Jamie that he should come despite the doctor telling him to stay and watch the kiosk. Still, it is closed, and Samantha does have boobs, so he can see where Jamie's coming from. As for the Commandant, Crossland finally gets him to stop worrying about the doctor not having a passport to get on with the less important matter of a dead man. He also brings up the guy who was in a crate and spots him from among the air traffic controllers in the room, although the doctor doesn't mention it yet. He also says that he believes Chameleon is a front for the mass kidnapping of young adults by aliens. Even Crossland diplomatically asks for evidence in response to that, so the doctor has the faux meadows join him in an experiment, having him hold out a cup and saucer, which the doctor freezes with the pen. Real proof, finally, that he's not a lunatic. Well, proof that he might be onto something anyway. We probably shouldn't leap to conclusions here. Jamie and Samantha return with the completed postcards that they found in the chameleon hangar, but also a new bit of evidence, the envelope that they had been found in addressed to the Chameleon Tours branch on the other end. See, they mail the cards to the destination, then they take them out of the envelope and mail them back again. That way it looks like they arrived at their destination when they didn't. Oh, and also it means that the poor people who brought them all the way there are probably the ones who are bringing it all the way back again. Poor dopes. There's a sense of fulfillment, carrying something halfway across the continent so that you can carry it back again. But why would anyone want to abduct these young people? Admittedly, that is a head-scratcher. Why would anyone want to have thousands of boomers? Crossland thinks the doctor might be onto something, as weird as he might be, and finally the commandant gives the doctor the run of the airport, on the condition that in 12 hours he report back with some hard evidence, not just a weird pen and some crazy theories. Oh, uh, speaking of the pen, Meadows reports in to kill Happy about what happened who is not too happy that he left. I know where he is. I could kill him. You're going to. Always present a plan that you know your boss is inclined towards anyway. To do it, Meadows puts a small device on the doctor's coat when he returns to air traffic control, although it prompts the doctor to goad him about being a double. The doctor and Jamie are soon searching a chameleon hangar, trying to find the door that reveals the secret room he knows that his attacker was hiding in although it'll take a little work. Bad guys make their secret entrances less obvious than the day of paintings with missing eye holes and such. Meanwhile, Crossland runs into Kill Happy at the kiosk, 
quite insistent on talking to the captain about what's been happening. And oh yeah, he'll talk to him all right. Out by our plane, which is definitely a perfectly normal plane. <laughs> he tells the captain that the flight has to be held up until his questions are answered. But once he sees the cockpit is not filled with aircraft instruments, I think he realizes the doctor was right, and he's tried to give a traffic ticket to a flying saucer. After Crossland is secured by the bad guys, the doctor finally finds his way into the secret room, where they find a chamber for those unaccustomed to Earth's atmosphere, like the Faceless Ones or Mark Zuckerberg. When he spots a view of the infirmary on the TV monitor, he's sure that he's about to crack this wide open. So Killhappy decides to use that device that Meadows planted on him earlier, disabling him with pain while the latest Chameleon Tours flight takes off with Crossland stuck on board, where he literally has a front row seat for what happens to the passengers. They vanish from their seats, leading us into episode four. Back in the hangar, Jamie is trying to see to the doctor, but Killhappy comes out with a ray gun, ready to kill him if he won't cooperate. He won't. And while a distraction by Samantha buys him a little time to struggle, in the end the dreaded freeze pen is used to incapacitate the two of them. He lays them and the doctor all in a row and, being kill happy, decides that a James Bond death is the only way to deal with them, setting up a laser that will slowly reach and then kill them, and then he proceeds to leave the room assuming it will all go according to plan, with a smile on his face, happy to know that even if he's not here, there will be killing happening. The doctor eventually comes around when the other two are talking, but nobody can move to escape the approaching laser. Because the others can slightly move, he has Samantha take out a mirror and hand it to Jamie, who uses it to reflect the laser back at the source, destroying it. A mixed blessing. They are saved, but I do have a soft spot for vacuum tubes. During this, the captain has contacted the base to let them know that he has Crossland to serve as an original and on a similar topic, our immigration bureaucrat has been taken and used by the Faceless Ones to create a duplicate of him. Now they have control over whether or not people can get in with a passport. When they finish up, the doctor arrives with Jamie faking to be ill, and he wants to allow him to lie down inside. But the nurse refuses, since, well, she's got a kidnap victim lying in there right now. It'd be crowded. Killhappy and the new immigration officer both agree the doctor really needs to die, but the plan is to wait for him to come to them and maybe do something better than a death trap this time, putz. Meanwhile, Jean has been phoning around to discover something shocking. All of the planes land without passengers. Do you realize what that means? So much greenhouse gas is being pumped out on empty flights. It's shocking. Seeing that Jean is more open-minded than the Commandant, the doctor takes her aside and shares his concerns about the medical center, and asks her to find a way to create a distraction so he can get inside. Normally having a sidekick wearing a kilt helps with that, but he sent Jamie off to keep an eye on Samantha, who has just bought a ticket from Chameleon Tours, in order to get to the bottom of this, much like Jonah got to the bottom of a whale. When she won't be talked out of this plan, Jamie wants to do the honorable thing and go in her place, but she won't have it. And when she suggests just buying a ticket of his own for 28 pounds, he balks like she just asked him to hand over a gold brick. So, he just kisses her while swiping the ticket. Bond. Jamie Bond. Just as the Commandant has arranged for an RAF fighter to tail that chameleon flight, Jean fakes passing out and grudgingly Nurse Pinto has to head up there to see to her. As the doctor pokes around, we see him unknowingly reveal that the real nurse is in a cupboard, but he does find those Wii controllers that the aliens use. In a moment that shows his badassery, he comes out while the immigration officer is sneaking up to shoot him. He does nothing to indicate that he spotted the alien until an approaching patient walks up. I'm just going off duty, but... Uh... This gentleman will be pleased to attend to you. That's a whole new level of cool, to not only spot and not give away that you have spotted an assassin, but to then only reveal the game when you have chores for him to do. And don't forget to tidy up after yourself, you deplorable lazy man. He heads up with the devices, but Meadows is gone for now, so we'll just have to content ourselves with the RAF chase of the departing plane, the one with Jamie aboard, remember. 
Jamie, who until recently assumed that these were animals, takes to the flight in much the same way that a turtle does, and at the sight of someone starting to eat, runs into the bathroom to be sick. Honestly, I know English food looks unappealing, but that's going overboard. This means that he misses out on the process that shrinks the passengers down, so that's a plus. A negative is that the RAF jet is spotted and shot down. The pilot killed almost instantly. They see it on the radar, but then see that the chameleon plane also appears to be crashing since it's standing still on the radar. They patiently explain to the doctor that standing still means the plane is dropping straight down, but he notes it could also mean the plane is going straight up into outer space. If so, that means either this is aliens or Richard Branson. The plane enters an alien station, bringing us to episode 5. The flight attendant questions the wisdom of destroying the plane, but the captain is certain that human minds cannot cope with a situation like this. To be fair, yes, our advanced fighter jet was just shot down by a commercial airplane carrying poor college students. That's a bit hard to sell. But the more you keep piling crazy up around you, the more people are going to start considering crazy. Even the Commandant is showing a willingness to tolerate the Doctor's theories, even if he still doesn't accept them. Jamie overhears all of this, but can only try hiding in order to avoid capture as he spots the aliens in their original form carrying things around. They're collecting all the passengers' luggage and carry-ons, meaning they now have the single largest collection of beetle albums, crystals, and bongs in the whole of outer space. Jimmy pokes around until he finds the passengers, shrunk down and immobile in a drawer, but the flight attendant pulls a gun on him before he has a chance to pick them up and make them dance together and kiss, like he normally would. Back at Gatwick, the Commandant learns the pilot was electrocuted, and there are cracks in his resolve now, admitting that with this mounting evidence he's finding it harder and harder to reject the doctor's crazy stories. To help him with the rest of the mental journey, the doctor spots the newly returned Meadows and seizes the opportunity to expose him. Meadows tries his best to make a break for it, but they restrain him and reveal that he has one of those devices on his arm, making him nervous because tampering with it would, and not to put too fine a point on it, fuck him up. He agrees to answer questions if he's left unharmed and admits to the satellite and explains this whole thing has been to deal with a catastrophe on their planet that left them without identities, but they can take on these human being identities. The initial plan is to use 50,000, though obviously there are a lot more aliens than that. This is probably just phase one of the operation. Take a bunch of jet-setting college students to start and then move on to those that people would actually care about. The originals are kept around the airport, insensate so they don't endanger the replacement. Only the machine can undo the process safely for the aliens, otherwise they would just die. The nurse is the only one who knows where her original is, down in the medical center, where Samantha happens to be right now. See, after Jamie took her ticket, she raised a fuss, so Kill Happy arranged for her to be brought inside, where, in a shocking defiance of type, or perhaps accepting his best killing days are behind him now, he took her prisoner instead and gave her to the nurse. But the doctor arrives before she can do anything to Samantha, freeing her while leaving the fake nurse in police custody. I'm surprised it went as well as it did, to be honest. Unfortunately for her, we do have the original in custody, so... Uh, note to self, device solves many of your problems, but it does create one very large one. The real nurse is freed, but when Samantha says what Jamie did, he knows that he's got to act fast before he winds up in a crate like Ben and Polly. Jamie's actually been strapped into a chair, but freed by Inspector Crossland, or rather, the one who has taken his place, the leader of these aliens. Surely the doctor will think of some way of rescuing us? Not this time, Jamie. This time, he's up against a mind superior even to his. The mind of the director. So far, he has only managed to outthink the key grip. Yes, the director has taken on the appearance of Crossland and pumped Jamie for information, even as the plane is being sent back for the final trip, to pick up everyone at Gatwick and bring chameleon tours to an end. The doctor has found the personnel files to identify all the duplicates, 
but when the commandant prepares to have them arrested, he tells them not to, to let them go so that they can be traced back to where Ben, Jamie, and Paul and all the rest of the victims have been taken. If he pretends to be a new form for Meadows, he and Nurse Pinto can fly back while the Commandant tracks down the original here at the airport, giving the Doctor leverage to try and get everyone back home again. Except the Captain is on to him, but he lets him come anyway in order to deliver him into the hands of the Director, who has just finished processing a duplicate from Jamie. And he doesn't seem to have the same willpower as Polly, because the moment that he's questioned Jamie's double spills, the Doctor is an alien who travels through time and space and knows even more than their people, like how to change his face without risk of melting. Naturally, the Director wants to turn him into one of them, and as the Doctor and Nurse Pinto are taken into custody, we head into Episode 6. The Doctor tries to continue his bluff, but the Captain says they know definitively that they're not duplicates. So this is going to be down to the Commandant now. And when the head of the airport police, or whatever he's called, it's Britain, so he probably has some kind of a fancy title. But anyway, he says that he needs to have enough people in order to help him out. With the force that he has, he's not going to be able to find him in time. So the commandant gets on the phone, has all incoming flights diverted and all outgoing ones placed on hold so that all of the airport personnel can join in the search. Meanwhile, the doctor is face to face with the director. There are only human beings. What are you? We are the most intelligent race in the universe. Well, someone's awfully full of themselves. Especially with that whole death trap thing that Kill Happy pulled. That's going to be a bit hard to square with their intelligence, huh? The doctor takes a moment to spread a little mistrust, pointing out that the commandant and his friends have their originals nearby and safe, while those like the captain have theirs down on Earth somewhere, hidden even from themselves so that there's no retrieving them or ensuring that no one stumbles over them. The greatest intelligence in the universe might just have a concern about that. After the director leaves, the doctor presses the point despite pushback from the captain, and finally decides to bluff and say they have already been found. Finally, they call up Gatwick to settle the matter, and the commandant recognizes that the doctor is trying to bluff them, so he continues that bluff. Except the one thing they can't say is where they found the originals to try to prove that they've actually done so. It makes backing up the bluff a little bit difficult. It's Samantha who finally cracks it, though. Having gone through a lot of things in the Chameleon's offices, she found that they had acquired 25 cars, the same as the number of people who have been replaced. But they'll need time to confirm that. It's the girl and your assistant. They think they've got a clue. Right. Now try and stall them. Chameleon headquarters to Gatwick Airport. We get the feeling you're stalling. The director returns, annoyed at this, and says to get with the processing. Except the doctor has a screwdriver. Down. Yes, very nice. It would have been better if I could have done it in some kind of sonic way, though. They repair it, but the ladies are already checking the long-term parking. Same as Meadows, who had slipped away earlier. He makes the mistake of going after Samantha, who you know is of half a mind to diddle with his armband on principle. Frankly, it's lucky for him the cops get there before she gets the chance. But yes, they have the originals now, and when this is passed along to the aliens, they naturally think it's another bluff. Which means... <coughs> Told you so! Well, this prompts an argument, as meltdowns are often wont to do. The captain is disinclined to take any chances, but the director doesn't think they should kowtow to the humans, which is easy to say when it's not your ass on the line. We also learn from the director that this is even worse than we had thought. Those originals are having the life drawn from them. In the end, they're going to die. I mean, we knew they were killers, but it's one thing that they're willing to just kill if they feel they have to. It's quite another that they're committing mass murder. 50,000 people, and that's likely just the beginning. It's a good thing the doctor came along. Oh, speaking of which, the Commandant says that unless he speaks to the doctor at once, he's going to deal with the captain next. The captain makes the director release him at gunpoint, and the doctor then proceeds to make him sweat before finally sauntering over to answer. Giving the captain a taste of his own mortality, the doctor then negotiates, 
release all the originals, and they will all be safely restored back to their previous chameleon forms. He'll also offer a few suggestions on a way out of their predicament so that it won't require mass murder. I mean, I know Kill Happy won't be pleased with that, but you gotta take what you can get. The point is, we might be able to find a way out of this without needing to kill anyone. Well, without needing to kill anyone else. The captain is quite cooperative after that and sees to bringing everyone back and of normal size. Can't have a bunch of doll people running around and turning Europe into frickin' Lilliput. Jamie gets a goodbye kiss from Samantha, and then it's down to the hangar where the TARDIS has been deposited. But Ben and Polly have some news. She's pregnant. Nah, just screwing with you. They've realized this is the very day that they had originally left in the war machines, and so they've decided to stay. A little tearful goodbye, and... As they go on their way, the doctor breaks the other bad news to Jamie. The TARDIS is missing. But who could be that evil to take the TARDIS? Well, I guess that's just another story. Oh, hey.